before we go to read that, that passage in Titus, I just thought we'd have a time of discussion. So if I can just have the PowerPoint on the board behind us. Thank you. So the start of this passage says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to us. The grace of God that brings salvation. Now we as Christians, we throw around the word salvation quite loosely and liberally. We tell people, oh, I'm saved. I'm saved by Jesus. We tell people, hey, you need to get saved. But we need to be able to explain what we mean by salvation. We need to be able to explain what we mean by the word saved. Saved from what? Saved for what? Or for whom? And so before I begin my message this morning, let's just get into small groups, maybe um, two, three, four, five. If you can just turn around in your chairs um, and face each other. We're just going to have a time of discussion about these questions on the board. So what do Christians mean when they talk about being saved? How would you explain to a non-Christian that they need to be saved? And what are we saved from? So we're just going to spend a few minutes discussing those things and then we'll come back to the sermon. Thank you. If we could just uh, wrap up our conversations. I don't know about you, but I had some really great conversations at the back. One of the things that was brought up is a, a salvation from a fear of death. I thought that was a really good one. Um, I was reminded uh, that the thief on the cross, you know, he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he was assured today you will be with me in paradise. What wonderful words that thief on the cross. He was saved from the fear of the unknown because Jesus promised that he would be welcomed into his everlasting kingdom. One of my favorite pictures of salvation is actually uh, the picture behind of the uh, surf lifesavers rescuing someone from drowning in the waters because if you've ever been caught in a rip or anything like that you're absolutely helpless you're you're drowning you know all you can do is scream out save me and and wave your hands around like you you literally cannot contribute anything to your salvation except for to cry out in utter um, humility and and fear lord or lifesaver save me and along comes this boat and they, they grab your hand and they pull you to shore and your immediate feeling is a sense of gratitude. Thank you so much for rescuing my life. Thank you for saving me. I think it's a beautiful picture of salvation. You see, salvation means different things in different contexts. Uh, for someone who's drowning, salvation means one thing, but for the Christian, it means something different. For the Israelites in the Old Testament, salvation uh, meant that God would rescue them from the Egyptians, that he would deliver them from a life of slavery um, in Egypt, and he would bring them into their own land, a land which was marked by fruitfulness and increase. We read in Exodus chapter 6, God said to Moses, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So salvation for the Jewish people meant that God would save them from their enemies, the Egyptians. And instead of living a life of slavery and barrenness under oppression from, from the Egyptians, uh, God would not just rescue them from that bad situation and just leave them out in the wilderness, God would actually bring them into a place where they could be fruitful um, and a place of increase and a place where they could have a future and a hope. Now, as we spend time in Titus this morning, we're going to be seeing what God's plan is for us as New Testament believers. We're going to be seeing God's plan of salvation for us. And in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the Israelites. We have been rescued from a life of slavery, a life of slavery to sin, a life that was leading to, to guilt and condemnation, and a, a life that was leading to separation from God. And He saved us from that, and He's bringing us into His everlasting kingdom. Um, before I... Well, actually, I will share the, the Bible verse to start with for this morning. So if we can just have that on the screen. Um, it's Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. It says that the grace of God 
that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, last week, I wasn't able to be at church because I myself was in quarantine and uh, recovering from my bout of coronavirus. Um, It's not very fun, so I sympathize with those who are at home, but the Lord will be with you. Uh, But uh, I thought it would be a good idea to sell some things in my spare time because I didn't have much else I could do. So I went on Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace and I was selling all sorts of things. And I'm really sad to say, as most of you know, I love my chickens, but I have a a real baby on the way, a human baby. And so I've decided that human babies are more important than chicken babies. So I put my chickens up for sale and I put my chicken coop up for sale and I decided to call it an end of that season for now. And uh, anyways, in the course of time, a lady contacted me and she said, oh, I'll be around on Sunday to pick up the chicken coop. I thought, okay, this is good. So I met her out the front on Sunday, last Sunday, and I, uh, I said to her, well, the chicken coop's actually down my, my hill. I, I live on acreage, but it's sloping land. It's pretty steep. It's about 20 degrees off the side of my, my house. And I said, we could drive down there. I have done that before in my car, but um, I said, we're probably better off just bringing the chicken coop up the top. And she says, oh, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. I've got a four-wheel drive high ace. And I said, a four-wheel drive high ace? And I've looked at this thing and... I mean, I was out of it. I was, you know, I was recovering from being sick. My mind wasn't all there. And and she she assured me that she's got this this four-wheel drive high ace that can do the job. And so I believed her and I said, okay, well, let's try it. And so she went down the side of my property and immediately she started slipping and she slid all the way down, left massive grooves all down the side and then got completely bogged in the bottom section of my property. And she stepped out of the car and she goes, what are we going to do? And she's driven two hours to to come pick up this chicken coop. And I'm like in quarantine and probably still contagious at that point. I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't house this lady. And then I was like, do I, do I lend her my wife's car? Like I was just completely baffled of what I was to do. So I was freaking out. And so Jess was trying to calm me down and mostly trying to calm this lady down because she was freaking out because she's like, I can't stay here. I'm like, yeah, no, duh, (laughs) you can't stay here. Um, but it was raining too, so it was like, how on earth are we going to get this car out? So I, uh, I called um, the towing company, and they had a lot of jobs on. They said, we can't get to you for a couple of hours. And I was thinking, well, even if they could get to me, I don't know how they're going to get this car up. There's only like a small area at the top, so you couldn't get a truck to pull it up. I then contacted my sister. She has a four-wheel drive, and she has recovery gear, but she didn't have the right gear. And when she arrived, she didn't seem to have the confidence that we'd be able to do this. And so I was like, it was completely beyond my strength. And so I finally bit the bullet in my, and I humbled myself and I called my dad. And it was the last thing I wanted to do because I didn't want to hear a lecture about how much of a goose I had been at even attempting this in a high ace because the thing had no flex and had street tires and everything. Anyways, I called my dad, hat in hand, I said, Dad, I've I've made an absolute mess of my life and I don't know how to get out of it, but I know you have a winch. I know you have a four-wheel drive. Can you please rescue us? And my dad, like the hero he is, he jumped in his car and he drove to my house and he got there and he said, this is easy. And he he pulled out his his brand new winch and winched it all down to the car and he um, got, you know, the strap. I don't know all the technical terms. You're going to have to forgive me. He got the strap and strapped the car to the tree so that it wouldn't slide down the hill and Anyways, about two hours later, he'd pulled this car all the way up onto dry ground and and we were saved, we were rescued. And to me, that was just the most amazing thing ever. I mean, to some people that seems small, but when all hope seems lost and a savior comes and rescues you like that, my heart towards my dad was nothing but love and admiration. I I would have cleaned his whole house, don't tell him this. I would have washed his car. I would have done anything for him because my heart was one of gratitude to him for saving me. He saved the day. And that's a bit like our message this morning. We read in verse 11, it starts by saying, 
that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So the first thing I want us to notice from our verse this morning is that salvation is initiated by God, not by us. This truth should be of great comfort to us this morning. You see, you don't need to try to save yourself. You don't need to polish your life up or wear nice church clothes or try to appear worthy before God so that He'll accept you. No, rather, it's God's grace that brings salvation. And so because it's based in His strength and His mercy, you don't have to do anything. You just have to be like that drowning person and raise your hands, or like me, calling my father, saying, Lord, help me. Dad, help me. I'm, I'm lost. It says that this salvation has appeared to all men. And what, it's, what, it's, what Paul's trying to say here is it's, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a prostitute. It doesn't matter if you're a, a rich businessman or just a normal law-abiding citizen. We all need to come to God on the same grounds. The grace of God has appeared to all men in the same way through Jesus Christ. Because it says in Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of God's glory. So we're all in that position of deadness and lostness from God. And so God has the ability to save us if we come to Him through the cross. Now, I, um, I spoke to my mom on the phone uh, last week, and she was really lovely because um, she knew I had coronavirus. And she said that she'd been praying for me and Jess, which I thought was just really lovely to have parents that pray for you. It's really comforting when you're in a bad place. Um, but then my mom on the phone, she started to say to me, like she started to speak down upon herself. She's like, listen, I know my Christianity and my you know, Christian experience isn't the same as yours. And, and then she started, started saying, listen, I know that God probably doesn't hear my prayers like he hears your prayers. And I was like, mom, what are you talking about? And uh, I just thought, what, what erroneous thinking. I said, I don't have some special hotline to God this morning. Like I don't, my phone, my phone calls to God aren't answered more than yours. I said, if they are though, the only reason they are is because I'm not coming in my name, I'm coming in his name. And that's the big difference. I explained to my mom, if you want a hotline to God, you can, anyone can. If they come to God through Jesus Christ, through his blood, which will cleanse you of all sin and make you right before God and welcome you into his family. If you come through Jesus, you can have access to God um, like anyone else. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. It doesn't matter if you're retired and at home. God is accessible to anyone who comes to him through Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we all know the verse. It says, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's the gift of God through His grace that we're made right with God. Now, if we think back to the story of my dad rescuing this lady, I didn't, I didn't do anything to help. I really couldn't. Um, I was completely helpless, and I acknowledge that to my dad, which is why he came to our rescue. And this is the same situation for us. If we want to access God, we've got to come humbly with nothing in our hands and say, Lord, save me. And the Bible says that God resists the proud person, but he gives grace to the humble. So when we humble ourselves, we receive the grace of God. The other reason my dad came to my rescue is because I'm his kid, and I asked him for help. Now, thankfully, I have a father on earth who loves me, um, who would go out of his way for me. And you see, when you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you too have a father, a loving heavenly father. I spoke to someone just recently, and they were telling me about how their earthly father basically abandoned them, abandoned them from a young age, and they grew up without a father figure. And I just had to remind this brother in Christ that he has a father in heaven, a loving heavenly father, and he doesn't need to be alone. Just because your earthly father may be, may be long gone and past, we have a father who endures forever. John chapter 1 verse 12, it says that as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe on his name. So you can become a child of God this morning by believing on his name. And in John chapter, uh, sorry, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. What a privilege. 
to be called a child of God. You want to know why so many people remain lost in our world? So many people are without hope. So many people are without a relationship with God. They're still trying to save themselves. It's as if I'd been at the top of that hill, stressing out like crazy because I didn't know how to get the car up the hill and trying everything in my own strength, which would have ultimately failed. I realized I needed help. I needed an outside source. And there's people everywhere trying to find the meaning of life without knowing the creator of life. And you're never going to find peace and you're never going to find satisfaction and you're never going to find that wisdom and that abiding relationship that you truly long for until you come to God the Father through Jesus Christ. So carrying on with our um, verse for this morning, this grace of God that brings salvation, it says that it teaches us to, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts so that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So at the start of this message, we ask the question, what does it mean when Christians say that we're saved? What are we saved from or for for what? Now, a lot of people think only in terms of salvation when it comes to everlasting life. They think, hey, well, I've been saved from hell. You know, I've, I've, I've been saved so that I don't have to be punished. I don't have to be um, guilty before God. Um, and they only seem to think about a future destination, that one day I'm going to be in heaven when I die. But they rarely ever think about salvation in terms of the here and now. God is in the process of saving us and preparing us for his heavenly kingdom. So um, it's not just a destination, but it's a journey we're on with, the, with, with God. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, there's a marker. That, there's lots of markers that describe what Christians look like. But in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, it says, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are evident. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So the difference between someone who is a child of God and a child of the devil is the one who is a child of God practices righteousness and loves his brothers and sisters in Christ. And as I said before, like Jesus said, my disciples will be known by their love for one another. These are markers that God has actually saved you, is that he is in the process of delivering you from worldly lusts into a life of righteousness um, before him. Now, we've heard it said many times before by Pastor Darren that grace is not a a license to sin. Uh, Some people mistakenly teach or think that because Christians say, hey, you know, you can be forgiven of your sins through faith in Jesus, that suddenly you can now live however you want. So I can go out and commit adultery or whatever because, you know, God's going to forgive me. But that's completely wrong thinking. Um, And that's not the kind of salvation that the Bible talks about. We've been saved by God's grace so that we can turn from a life of sin to a life of righteousness. We were servants of sin, but now we're servants of God. So it's not a freedom so that we can do the the wrong thing with, with more freedom. It's a freedom so that we have the ability to love others because we're no longer a slave to our selfish desires. Romans chapter 6 verse 17 says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak to you in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members, that that is the members of your body, just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness in your former past, and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So when you understand God's plan for your life and you, uh, you understand the great sacrifice Jesus made on your behalf, you don't want to sin. You don't want to continue doing the things that would break his heart. I mean, thinking back to that story when my um, dad rescued that lady's car, we were kind of uh, we were kind of cruel to him at the at the end because uh, as the car got up on dry ground, we, we decided amongst ourselves that we'd have a little joke with him, and we said to him, "Oh, great! Now that the car's back on dry ground, we can um, we can turn it around and get a better angle and head back down for that chicken coop." And he just he had a mask on, and I could see his jaw drop through the mask 
because my goodness, we were not about ready to go back down that side of that property again because it took him like two hours to rescue us. And what a slap in the face it would have been if we'd done that. It would have showed utter disregard for the sacrifices he made to get us out of trouble. And that's the same with Jesus. When we behold the cross, when we behold the sacrifice, the great anguish that Jesus went for us, through for us so that we could be made right with God, um, our hearts are filled with gratitude and love for God. And we want to love him because he first loved us. It's just a natural flow on effect. So show me a Christian who wants to continue in sin. And I'll show you a Christian who doesn't really appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus. A Christian who probably hasn't really believed that Jesus died for them and hasn't really considered the cross. One of the reasons we do communion so frequently at church is because we want to be reminded all the time, remember my blood, remember my body that was broken for you. Because as we remember those things, our heart is again entwined in love and His, and we want to please Him. We want to live for Him. We want to be His purchased possession because we understand how much He did for us. Second Peter chapter 1 warns us that some Christians have become short-sighted. He talks about the various virtues of righteousness, like self-control and humility and goodness. And then he says, if any believer lacks these things, he is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Let's not forget this morning that we have been cleansed from our old way of living. Let's not forget that he has set us free so that we can love and serve him and love and serve one another. Uh, so God's rescued us from this penalty of sin, which is condemnation and alienation from his presence. And he's also in the process of delivering us here and now. The grace of God teaches us to deny sinful appetites. This is the exact opposite message to the message of the world. The message says, you know, of the world says, if it feels good, you should do it. You know, all of the advertising is trying to appeal um, to your emotions, um, to your pride. You know, if only you had this car, you would be the cool guy in the neighborhood and you'd go on adventures like James Bond. Or if only you had this house, or if only your kids looked like that. The enemy is always trying to provoke us to covetousness, pride, selfish appetites but God's grace teaches us to deny those things that are evil but it's not the kind of denial that turns us into like Christian monks or uh, like a Christian form of Buddhism you see God has given us all things richly to enjoy that's what Paul said to the rich believers in Timothy's letter he's given us all things richly to enjoy you know it's not an accident that food tastes good it's not an accident that we enjoy fellowship with one another or that we enjoy sports. Like God wants us to enjoy creation, but he doesn't want creation to lord over us and enslave us because we're to have one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So the command of Jesus is if you want to follow him, you need to deny yourself. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, it says that Jesus died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So do you want to know the secret to denying these sinful lusts? Quite simply, it's just living for him. The best way to counteract sin in your life is to present your members, the members of your body, your thought life, your hands, your money, your talents, present them to God for his service because when you're employed in service to God you're not going to be able to employ the members of your body for sin it's kind of like a marriage you know um, I'm married and I love my wife and one of the greatest things that keeps me from wandering with my eyes and looking at other women or thinking about what life would have been like if I had married someone else and wishing that I'd lived a different life, one of the best things that keeps me from all of that rubbish is falling in love with my wife, spending time with her, um, serving her, you know? I tried to buy her a cheesecake the other day because she's got cravings as a pregnant woman. And uh, 
I wanted to do that because I wanted to show her how much I appreciate all the sacrifices she's made in our marriage. And I appreciate the love she has for me. And so likewise, if you're walking with God, like it says in the scriptures, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So if we're walking with God and walking in the spirit, we're walking in the love, joy, peace, self-control and kindness of God, there's not going to be any room to rebel against our God if we're walking with him. I want you to hear how Paul describes the conversion experience of the Thessalonians. Uh, so it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. These Thessalonians had turned from idols. They'd turned from self-service. They'd turned from serving other things that couldn't profit them and now we're serving the Lord and waiting for His Son from heaven, a command that we should be abiding into, waiting for His Son from heaven. Now, do you ever have times where, well, do you remember back when you were a kid and your parents might have gone away? Maybe you were a teenager at this stage. Your parents went away for the night or they went away for the weekend and you had the whole house to yourself and it was just amazing. You could do whatever you wanted. You could raid the fridge. You could make a mess. You could turn your video games up really loud if you had video games. It was awesome. Well, I had many experiences like that as a young person, but even as an adult, there's been times where my wife's gone away for the weekend and had a girl's weekend with some of her friends and I get the house to myself. And for some strange reason, every time she goes away, I have to go out and buy ice cream and I have to like, watch like a Star Wars marathon and for some reason by the end of the night I end up with like five cups all around me and rubbish and crumbs all over the couch and I just look like an absolute slob and uh, this is this is the story of my life when my wife goes away however I usually know when she's coming back and so you know it might be a Sunday that she's coming back and so I spend those last couple of hours vacuuming the house, collecting all the cups, collecting all the plates, you know, putting on a shirt that doesn't have stains on it, and looking presentable so that when she comes home, she thinks, oh, wow, nothing has changed. You know, my clean, neat, tidy husband and my tidy house, everything is normal. You know, this is kind of an imperfect illustration of what it can be like as a Christian if we're not expecting Jesus to return at any moment. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom their master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat, and Jesus himself, the master, will come and serve them. And if he should come at the second watch or come at the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants." So Jesus is is telling us we need to be waiting for him. We need to be waiting for our master to come home. We don't know the set day that he's returning. We need to be living our lives in light of the return of Christ. And that's what we get from our passage this morning. If I can have that back up on the screen, Zach. Our passage this morning in Titus says that um, we are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So... We, we, the way we live a righteous life is in, not only in relationship with God, but in a relationship that waits for Him to come again for us, His bride. So He's coming back to receive us to Himself. And it's described in the Bible as a blessed hope. So our blessed hope in the Bible, it's, it's not only to spend eternity with our Lord, but also to be delivered from this world of sin and corruption. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we read about our future. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's our hope. Our hope is that when Jesus returns to earth, we're going to have a new earth and a new heavens where righteousness dwells. You see, we're not going to fix the world by electing a new prime minister. We're not going to fix the world by bringing out stricter climate change laws. 
you know, by, by any of these means. You know, they can be good things. They can have good temporal fixes on our world. But the problem is inward. The whole world is corrupt. The whole world is filled with leaders that have um, hypocrisy. And, and it's not all about serving the people. They, they have their own motives. But we have a righteous king that's coming back for us, a good king, a king who demonstrated his righteousness while he walked the earth and lived a sinless life. That sinless one, that sinless Jesus, is coming back on the clouds to establish his kingdom on the earth. And we're going to live forever with him in a new earth where righteousness dwells. That is our blessed hope, a relationship with God that endures forever with other people where righteousness prevails. The last verse in our passage this morning, Titus chapter 2, verse 14, says, Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. How exciting. God wants us to be his own special people. We're the called out ones, the ones that he calls to himself, and he calls us his bride. See, the sacrifice of Jesus was to redeem us from every lawless deed. Um, and that context is not just redeeming us from the guilt of sin, but it's also redeeming us from the pattern of, of living in a life of sin. Jesus is saving us from a life characterized by lawless deeds so that we can be a purified people set apart for him, marked by our passion for good works. First Peter chapter 2 says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had once not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshy lusts which war against the soul having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We've been purchased by Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. We're a forgiven people as Christians and we're a freed people. God wants us to use that freedom in loving service to Him. And that's what this passage is all about. We live in light of the return of Jesus and our heart of gratitude and love towards Him for being the one who, who paid the ultimate price by dying on that cross, by suffering in our place, so that we could, we could be brought near to God, um, provokes us to want to love Him and want to serve Him and want to eagerly wait for His return to receive us to Himself. It says in my last verse, in 1 John chapter 2, it says, Now little children, abide in Him, that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I'm just going to pray now. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a loving heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying that ultimate price at the cross, that your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, so that we now have boldness and access to approach the throne of God to know you as a loving Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, I'm thinking of that verse. You said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And you said, if we have an earthly father and you ask of your earthly father for a fish, will he give you a scorpion? Or if you ask him for bread, will he give you a stone? How much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So we thank you that you are a good Heavenly Father who gives good gifts to his children. And we want to be waiting for your return, Lord Jesus. We want to be found ready to meet you, ready with joy to receive you as our King and to see righteousness established on the earth. Thank you that you're saving us, Lord, and thank you that you will ultimately save us at the end of days. In Jesus' name, amen.